May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as I was saying, um, I absolutely love the Boundary Waters. It's one of these places way up there in the north woods of Minnesota that I just can't seem to get out of my head. And uh, <clears throat> someday I would love to own a rustic little cabin. It doesn't have to have running water or electricity or anything. Just a place to escape to every once in a while way up there in the north woods. I'd love to have a little spot on a cold lake out in the middle of nowhere. And I love this part of the country for lots of different reasons, but one of the reasons I love it is because it feels so remote and so untouched by human hands. It's just this uh, place that's been set aside for people to come and to experience what it was like before we developed everything. And uh, I think one of the things that is so funny about getting up to the boundary waters are those little dirt roads that I was uh, telling the kids about. Uh, how many of you know what washboard roads are? few of you have lived in the country before. <clears throat> well, uh, they get their name because they look, the, the road is a dirt road or a gravel road, and it looks literally like that washboard that great-grandma used to scrub the clothes on, you know, or maybe great-great-grandma, depending on how... Uh, how young you are. Um, but the, the road is created by the rain, and uh, of course it's smooth at one point, but the rain comes and washes it, and it literally will just about shake the teeth right out of your head. Um, those roads are pretty rough, some of them. Some of them are, are full of deep potholes that you kind of have to drive around and maneuver. Sometimes you end up driving into the ditch a little bit to get around a certain part of those roads. But every single one of those roads, at least in my experience, has led to something pretty amazing. A pretty amazing place. A place where I know that I can go and kind of disconnect and uh, just focus on what God has for me in this life. I love those roads, but I also love um, the lakes. The lakes are so beautiful. They're so cold and so clear that on a still day, they seriously do look like glass. You can use them. You know, out in the Boundary Waters, you don't really bring a mirror along. It's kind of a luxury, and so you can use the lake literally as a mirror. Creatures just so incredibly diverse and interesting, things that I've never seen around here, moose, black bears. I saw my first beaver out in the boundary waters, loons, of course. There's little bits of nooks and crannies of creation that when you go to the boundary waters, it looks like no human being has ever set foot on them. For me, it's a magical place, but it's also a little bit dangerous getting around. I have a plan to be there um, starting after worship next Sunday for about a week. I'm going with a, a few pastors, and so I suspect that uh, when I get a chance to preach again this summer that you'll be hearing more about the Boundary Waters and our trip um, the next time I preach. And I hope, I hope, that I get to hit as many of those little dirt roads as I possibly can on my way up. In our story for today, there's another kind of road. It's a wilderness road, just like out in the Boundary Waters, but it also leads to a pretty amazing place. It's the road in our story, it's the road between Jerusalem and Gaza for sure, but it's also the road between unbelief and faith for one man. The last six weeks we've been taking you through this preaching series, it's a spirit thing. We've been talking about the way the Holy Spirit works in the book of Acts in and through God's people, the people that God has uh, selected and chosen to bring his word from Jer Jerusalem to Judea, 
to Samaria, and then to all the ends of the earth, it says at the beginning of Acts. And we've heard story after story after story of the power of the Holy Spirit to come and sweep through God's creation and fill God's people with faith. And as we've heard these stories, we've heard also about the good news of Jesus, which is really what the Holy Spirit uses to create faith in his people. But the road to, from unbelief to faith, I think, is sometimes an interesting one. As a pastor, I've had the honor and the privilege of hearing people's stories over the years, people's histories, all of the things that make up their lives. And um, I've heard stories not just about their personal history, but also their faith stories. And, you know, some of those stories that I've heard over the years have been, well, I guess they've been pretty uh, run-of-the-mill or pretty simple, at least on the surface. You know, oh, pastor, I was baptized and I was brought to Sunday school every Sunday morning, and I went to confirmation, and I was confirmed, and uh, I graduated from college, and I didn't go to church for a while. I'm really sorry. And, uh, but I'm back now, and, um, you know, I, I want to get married in the church, and I got married in the church. And a few years later, I started having kids, and I brought them to be baptized. And, you know, I hear those stories, and some of those stories, I talk with people old enough that they start to reach the end of their lives and they tell me about the, the joys and the struggles and the hardships that they've had. And then, as a pastor, it's the honor and privilege to preside at their funerals. There we tell stories, faith stories. Sometimes I've heard this joke with pastors that our call, our job, is to hatch, match, and dispatch God's people. Except that, for me, it's never been that simple. I've never really hatched, matched, or dispatched anyone. I've heard your stories, not all of yours, of course, but stories of people full of faith, just like you, and those stories are never simple. My experience is that your stories are full of complexity. Your stories are full of doubt and struggle and trial. Your stories are full of temptation, maybe even denial. I know my own story of faith is much like that. And I've also heard the other side, your story is full of, full of joy and commitment and triumph and, and blessings. And as long, I think, as long as I've taken the time to really understand and listen and interpret your stories I've never encountered a simple story of faith. So we have in our story for today, not just a simple story of faith, but a complex one. We hear the complex faith story of a complex man. The Holy Spirit calls the deacon Philip out onto a wilderness road from Jerusalem to Gaza. And on the road, Philip encounters a powerful Ethiopian man whose own road to faith is complex. We learn in the story that the, the, this Ethiopian man, this Ethiopian eunuch, is, is a traveler. He's a traveler because he's traveling somewhere south of Egypt, all the way north to Jerusalem, to worship with the Hebrew people, with the Israelites, or at least their descendants. This man does not have the Jewish faith, and yet he is curious enough to want to travel all the way from south of Egypt to Jerusalem, and he's on his way back home, and he's riding, we're told, in a chariot. A chariot. He's not on a donkey. He's not on foot. Someone else is driving him. And he has the luxury of being able to sit and read. And we're told in this story that the man is reading uh, not something uh, from his home country, but apparently he's purchased a very expensive scroll from the Old Testament, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Maybe it's the scroll that he heard read in worship while he was up in Jerusalem. 
And he is there with a driver bouncing along the road, seeking meaning and understanding. And he reads these words like a sheep, he was led to slaughter. The Ethiopian man turns to Philip in the chariot and he says, Who is this that's being talked about in the scroll? Is this Isaiah himself talking about himself or is this someone else? And Philip begins to open up the story of Jesus to the Ethiopian man on the road. Somewhere on that road from Jerusalem to Gaza, somewhere on the road between unbelief and faith, Philip the deacon begins to open up the good news of Jesus to this powerful Ethiopian man. And as Philip listens to the man's story, as he understands and interprets the scriptures about Jesus, the Ethiopian man begins to believe. It's the story of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and it begins to weave itself together with the story of the Ethiopian man. Somewhere along the road, the story of Jesus becomes not just words on a page, but God's word, living and written on the heart of that powerful Ethiopian eunuch. Philip asks the man, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I unless someone's there to guide me? And what happens next is my favorite part in the whole story. And because it's my favorite part, I want to do a little pastor geek out moment with you for a second. Okay, so just play along with me if you would. There are these black pew Bibles in front of you. Try to find one and take it out. You can just humor me for a minute. Go toward the end of the book on page 892. The page numbers are at the very top. Turn to page 892. You might have to get out your cheaters to see this if you're needing to read. Page 892. And there's two columns, and I want you to look at the right-hand column and go toward the bottom, the last paragraph, verse 36. You all just about there? Okay. I'll read it just in case you can't see it. Verse 36. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Keep your finger there for a second. Apparently, nothing not even verse 37. Look at the passage closely. Verse 36, as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Verse 38. There is no verse 37. Why? We're helped out a little bit. At the very bottom of the page, there are some notes. Note H. Other ancient authorities add all or most of verse 37. And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That little note, other ancient authorities add, is a polite way of saying that was never in the original manuscripts. In all of the original manuscripts that we have, that we use to teach us about Scripture, that verse 37 was never there. There were some Bibles a long time ago that included that verse, 
but not most of ours today. And so we skip verse 37. Why is that? Because it puts a condition on the man being baptized. The man says to Philip, look, here's some water. We've been traveling along this road. You've been teaching me about Jesus. You've been opening up the scriptures to me. I want to be baptized. What's to prevent me? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. If the Holy Spirit has done all the work of calling Philip and the Ethiopian man together on that lonely, dangerous road from Jerusalem to Gaza, if the Holy Spirit has done all that work in opening up the scriptures to the Ethiopian man, then what is to prevent him from being baptized What is to prevent the Holy Spirit from bringing this man to faith? Absolutely nothing. And so it makes me wonder about your own stories, about your own wilderness roads, your own lonely and dangerous roads that you've traveled in life. Maybe they're roads that are full of all of those things, doubt, Trial, temptation, denial. Maybe they're full of anger or resentment or shame. What wilderness road have you traveled in your life? And what have you been putting in the way of the Holy Spirit? What has been put there by someone else? Because you see, The Holy Spirit will stop at nothing to bring you to faith. There is absolutely nothing that can stand in the way of the Holy Spirit to give you faith. Today, right here, right now, God is bringing you to faith and clearing out all of those dangerous and lonely parts of those wilderness roads that you've been traveling and creating faith in you. Nothing can stand in the way. Not doubt, not struggle, not trial, not temptation, not anger or resentment. Nothing will stand in the way of the Spirit. So faith must be a Spirit thing. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus, amen.